Can you hear me, or do you want me to switch this thing on? Switch. No, maybe it's good. The benefit of the webcast. Well, we're all happy to be here. I think I've been alone and some people say that it's a bit of an, an incursion into their, their time when they should have been involved with other things. But at the last meeting, we decided as a majority of the committee that we would have this meeting at the first available opportunity, and I'm afraid this is it. Okay, so welcome all, even though I know a lot of you are going to be someone else. Which is the football team? Watch your football team. All right. So do that and get it. I, I, think, I think your ability to watch the football may depend on your ability. Uh, I'm talking yours, I mean, not yours, I mean, the collective ability. Okay, will somebody be so kind as to um, move that the minutes of the meeting of Monday the 4th of March are true? Yeah. Can I generally agree? Yeah. Then we can be signed at some point. Um, so, what is the declarations, Chair? Oh, yes, indeed. Are there any um, declarations of uh, interest of a pecuniary, a declarable pecuniary kind? No, I didn't get any votes, so the answer is no. So, we've, uh, we can go on to the uh, item three then. We've confirmed that the, 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 the uh, I've got that the wrong way around, but we have confirmed that it's right here. So it goes to item three, which is internal audit reviews. And Mark, what do you do? The purpose of this report is to update members on the outcome of the two internal audit reviews <coughs> on the technical effectiveness of systems, processes, and operation across the council for the verification and the validity of the supply VAT registration numbers and the appointment of uh, an employment emergency workers. Finally, it should be all that's identified the following uh, in respect of the verification of VAT registration numbers. It was clearly identified that Council has a system in place that satisfies the requirements of HMRC. It's consistent with the approach adopted by the majority of councils across the North West of England and is also consistent with advice currently being provided by various professional bodies and so on. A number of actions, however, were identified for consideration by management to further strengthen operations. And these have been included within uh, an action plan attached to the report. Senior management have undertaken these actions with immediate effect and recall the detail of the action plans included in the report. For the appointment and employment of agency workers, um, the review identified that whilst an established system is in operation, to improve, improve the clear requirement and current best practice, includes implementing more robust procedures across a number of elements of the system, including the appointing of agency staff monitoring and management of the arrangements, contract documentation and R35 communications. Management's response again to the findings is included with action plans, excuse <coughs> has been taken immediately to improve system and operations. We have with us a couple of members of staff from uh, the uh, HR unit, from the unit of HR, uh, it, it is in attendance this evening, so should we have any detailed questions in relation to actions that have been undertaken. Um, members are asked to say no to the report. Uh, at this point, I'm happy to take any questions. Jeff? Yes. Um, <coughs> thank you for the, the report. And I know you're asking us to note the findings. Um, however, and it's kind of floats over the top of some of this. But given the recommendations that you've made in 3.3, and then in the executive summary starting at page 33. Um, it appears as though there are, um, I think, weaknesses in the, the process. And certainly in terms of, I think I've argued this for some time, and I know a number of other colleagues have, is where you say, in appendix A, page 33, um, I think in 133, talk about um, details regarding agency workers are shared on a regular basis, senior managers and members. Um, I'm not sure which members are shared with. But you go on to say a robust analysis of the use of agency interim workers by management teams across the organisation is required to further enhance the process. 
I think for me, and this is where um, it either by um, by dint of lumping, for want of a better expression, agency workers, so social workers, children, a range of key people that we need to get on an unfolding instant basis, uh, with uh, consultants that come in and can cost you a full job, you know, thousand pounds a day, etc. I think there are there are those elements need to be disentangled to some extent because at the moment the entangling of those allows those people that want to use consultants more to try and hide behind the fact that we're also talking about agency workers. And um, and when it comes to consultancy, these major consultancies that are often being paid over 200, 500, 800 pounds a day, um, I think that before any of that, those appointments are made, but I do think that there should be a um, councillor um, oversight of some of those decisions. Now, whether that is by uh, the relevant cabinet member reporting to uh, members about a decision that they've taken, or whether it's through the Employment Appointments Committee process, I'm, I'm relatively relaxed, but I do think if we're taking on consultants of that sort of day rate, that it should be reported, uh, not decisions taken solely by the executive, uh, the officer court alone, but there should be political oversight of that. And I think we'd all agree at the moment it is a consultancy spend for the council over two million is a is a matter of uh, public interest. I will also say, and you go on to talk about um, uh, IR 35, I think, here, um, in, in these findings. I, I, so I'll, um, it's not an interest, but it's experience. I was around when IR 35 came in, and a whole number of consultants, because they Fundamentally, the idea is to make sure they're paying the right amount of tax. That's what it's about. You know, I'm paying the right amount of tax on the income that they're generating. So the government brought in IR35 to make sure that that tax was being properly paid. And there were a series of tests, and the consultants hated them, these tests. And you had to go through the number of questions. Are they replacing the member of staff and so on and so forth? And if they were doing the job of the member of staff, um, then they, IR35 applied and they had to pay income tax and they had to appear on the payroll. So what they did to get around that was come up with uh, what they called an umbrella company. Yeah? So you associate yourself with an umbrella company and the contracting body contracts with the umbrella company and you in terms of your uh, contractor, your consultant. Uh, for services, provide services through that umbrella company and therefore you can still consider yourself a limited company and just pay corporation tax instead of income tax. I think as a public body that we are, I don't think we should be bringing people into the umbrella companies. I'm accepting of course the work of you know, social workers etc etc but the people that are selling services uh, and limited company to sell individual services and we go on to another matter later. I think that's really inappropriate. And I do remember, because I asked the question, um, actually when I was leaving the council, I asked the question about whether we had anybody who was, uh, that we were employing on a, on a day rate. And I was assured by the finance department, as was the bench here, that all the people that we brought in were on, on payroll. So we weren't paying limited companies to provide individual services. And I think if we had that arrangement, we would be a lot clearer uh, in terms of we would feel a lot more confident that the right levels of tax were, were being paid. And so I, I see we talk about strengthening controls over determining and communicating our 35 status. I think we should be 
if we're bringing in consultants, we should be bringing them in on payroll. And so all the taxes paid on payroll, if they're entitled to when they go back, then clearly people can, can reclaim as per ask for that and deal with their costs. Jeff, well, I, I think, think you have made your point pretty clearly. Good. Well, can we ask officers to comment on it? Well, I, I'm just going to point out that I know last time, and this is where interesting comments <laughs> actually, that a one officer was very hostile to that idea, as I recall. But then, because they have originally been brought in as a consultant. So, I, I think we do need to, uh, need to pick up that. So, what I'd like to see off the back of this is political oversight or councillor oversight of the appointment of any consultants. And I'd all like, also like us to recommend that we operate on the basis of no more IR35 and we actually go through the payroll. And I'm happy to hear any answers that people say that that's why that would be too difficult or would disadvantage the council in any way. Jeff, let's let the officers um, come back to you and then we'll work over them and there's anyone else to go. Anyone else on this before? Um, yes, through you, Chair. Um, yeah. Can I just ask, following on from um, Jeff's query, whether or not the Inland Revenue have um, given any guidance so far on our use of IR35 and payroll and the use of limited companies like Four Chance Associates and whether or not they have deemed that uh, Four Chance Associates was correct in its status as opposed to being on payroll?
and I think you're probably in very shy end of it, Joy. So so can I so can I suggest it to me?
much you do in the last. If, if, if we had employed people who were outside of 35 on that basis, how does that work? So where you've got, for instance, sorry, if I just clarify, where we've got people like uh, agency workers who are, have to come in at 9 o'clock, finish at 5, and tell them their time to start and finish, how can they be on time? Okay, so you chair. Um, I think the response to that is, in, and that's why in the vast majority of cases, and I think we can look at the numbers and provide some assurance around that, is um, by the way, in 2025, <coughs> our default position as a council when IL35 is introduced was certainly for those operational uh, roles in the government post, IL in scope, IL35. We do have some unique arrangements, and probably would be appropriate to, to mention here, but where the, the arrangement is a little bit different. For example, the individuals may be able to send substitutes to do the work if they're not available themselves, and that, that starts to take some of the tests for HMRC, um, but they are quite limited. Um, so, so, yeah, the, the vast majority of our agency in terms of inside our 35 months of the issue is taken. David? Yeah, thank you.
operate at pace and work and trying to make game home and work so that's the uh, requirements as quickly as possible. Uh, yes, I, well, I did ask the question about whether or not those people that are not high on 35 that are consultants, like Forge Associates, um, has the Inland Revenue agreed with you that they should be outside of high on 35? Um, or have they said to you, we don't agree with the way you, you monitor it and the way you specify whether somebody's high on 35 or not? I mean, how do you determine it on the job that we're going to do or the pay rate? Okay. Because yeah. is there a difference between if you bring in an interim or somebody on, say, over £250 a day, is there a figure at which you decide they won't be IR35, they'll be a consultant? Because A, they're not being taxed in the same way and it's easier to sort of circumvent some systems if they're not IR35. Through the chair. Um, the, the day rate or the hourly rate isn't an issue. It's the nature of the arrangement. And um, as Councillor Rudy mentioned, the, um, if you like, the, I think there's a series of 10 or 12 questions that HMRC have laid out on their calculator, which include the whole range of tests, really. Um, That's very good. Um, yeah, for you, Jazz, as yes. ever. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, uh, uh, in truth, when the um, IR35 legislation came out, we did have quite a lot of challenge back from existing interim as to whether um, and agency workers and social workers as to whether they felt they were in the scope or not. Uh, as I say, opposition was um, in the vast majority of cases they were. Um, so it isn't a day rate, it's about the nature of where. Um, what's quite complex is we've got the matrix arrangements, but then there's also a procurement process which allows a different route to secure work of different natures, whether that might be in a building or, or assets or, and, and, and different things. That's just the council's everyday business. Of course, some of those arrangements also, um, you know, they, they would require to go through the tender period of that process of our, our procurement and really affect their supply and services. And there's, there's probably hundreds of thousands, and some of those people call themselves consultants. Um, and it might be more ad hoc services like providing. So it gets, I'm, I'm, sorry, the answer to questions go wrong and did uh, answer, but I'm not aware of HMRC of any particular um, comments around our 35 arrangements. No, I've got to turn it on. Jeff and Chris. Jeff, because if you're all going to just like that, Chris, come back here and then he has to become. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Um, you mentioned that the points that HMRC put forward. For, for one of the points is the question will be is the time scale or time limit when we have contractors in the court and when we have consultants in when they become part and parcel of the, of the furniture really? I think one of the points is. I think it's actually clear here today that the contract will become so ingrained that it will become part of the company's structure with people reporting them, for example. This point is employment rather than self employment. So, do we have the time limit? So, somebody who's on this thousand pound a day, family, whatever it is, is there a time scale that says, well, they've got people reporting to them because they're interim directors or whatever. <coughs> after six months, after four months, do we now look at changing the rules or do we just carry on? Um, th there's a couple of different aspects to, to the question. Um, under the agency worker act after 12 weeks, um, all agency workers, no matter what they can allow them day rate, um, do assume some rights which are compatible with uh, employed workers. And that really was a safeguard to stop um, you know, organisations using agency workers only. <coughs> and includes things like the ability to apply for jobs and and this was part of the agency where it makes about 2012. Um, but in terms of the second part of the question, it isn't, um, it isn't around the time that IR35 will change or whether the person's um, reporting or got you know, land management responsibilities. Um, just to be I think if somebody's working for us, like there's a line manager from day one, they would be in the scope of IR35 because they'd be covered in a post. Um, and so we'd set them up that way. Um, it, it doesn't really matter if that's for kind of two months or months or six months, the IR35 spaces wouldn't change. Can I just follow up with a question? Sorry, thanks, Chair. Yeah. yeah, my question was though, do we, as a council, we're entitled to put a, a time limit on their own to say that they are not now contractors, they are actually part of the business, if you like. So therefore, we can change their status. 
uh, do we do that or do we, or, or do we pay a thousand pound a day for that information or something like that? Okay, as we did say, we're, we're not entitled to change the status um, if somebody calls in as an agency worker um, or an interim, then um, we can't impose on them to become a paid employee or to go on the payroll, that would be their choice. Um, so, so, so no one is the answer to that. Um, obviously what we're looking to do is limit the uh, length of time that we have some of these arrangements in place and kind of some of the auditors as we've well. done. Um, but no, we're not entitled to convert him. Thank you. Well, Jill, do you want to say something we simply add to that? I want to bring Jeff in last. Because, uh, oh, can I just say something? Through you, Chair, from a previous audit, um, this is only in scrutiny committee. We have had interims on lots of two years, two months, and just around £400,000 for those two years and two months. Would you consider that working for the Royal Royal Council for two years and two months and earning £400,000 was excessive? Do you want me to come back on that? In some cases, it is a supply and demand um, situation. So, if we're looking for an executive interim to fill a particular role, then through Matrix, we'll, we'll set out where, what we're looking to, to pay and where we think um, would be reasonable in terms of the, the length of time, etc., uh, and the level of expertise that we need. And then, what we'll come to with Matrix, we'll put that up to all the agencies, as I mentioned before, to say, uh, Work Council's got this particular assignment, 
this is what it's looking to pay, and the CVs will come back in accordingly. And in some cases, yes, there's some negotiation around, around that rate. Uh, in other cases, it's you know, can be fulfilled fairly uh, in a straightforward way. So there's an element of um, what people are prepared to, to come for, in truth, from, you know, from different parts of the country, um, and also a lot of the, you know, what, what we see as a, as a reasonable rate for the, for the role. I've got Julie Venture. Thank you, Chair. This, this is just, I, I think actually you've answered my question through, Chair. Um, but again, I would reiterate that I think that being the case for the jobs which are the exception of the rule, so the more difficult to place jobs, which tend to be the uh, plan level spec jobs, then I would like to see some sort of um, Political oversight. Political oversight, yeah, thank you, Jeff. Political oversight on those decisions because I think quite clearly there needs to be a time limit. You can't go on forever. Chair, I've got something to move that I think might help the committee and might move us on. So, shall I try that? Well, I think some people will resolve, Jeff. It would be very, very welcome to you. Good. So, um, someone might, it's a bit scribbled there, so someone might want to make a. Sorry, it's a bit scribbled, so someone might want to make a note of it if they can. So, um, I don't know whether we can demand or recommend, let's make the assumption we recommend to the council or cabinet that um, if any company or individual is being recruited via a consultancy um, for over 250 pounds, I think it would be over 250 pounds a day, that should be um, that should be uh, susceptible. Uh, the right word is to political oversight. So it should need to sign off a, by a cabinet member or uh, or someone. So that would be the first thing. The other thing, and I know you referenced this within the report, uh, that you're going to do some more work on it by our thirty-five. But I would also recommend, or oh, the committee would recommend, that uh, work is done to. For people over to at the day issue to verify whether the IR35 assessment that had been made by the line manager is accurate because again it's all in how we answer those questions and the other uh, recommendation I would make because we've got an example further on which I won't reference because we haven't got to it yet uh, where people have been kept on for over two years and their job has changed. And how can their job change if it was if they were IR if they weren't IR35? Uh, and how could that there was no re-procurement to see whether that person was the right person? They just seem to be treated as a kind of member of staff, and we all know of other examples. But so I also think that there should be a um, a review led by HR if necessary to see whether anyone who has had more than two continuations, whether that is appropriate or whether they are now actually taking a full-time job. And let me be clear, let's disentangle, and I would prefer these reports, disentangle the ongoing operational activity of the council, i.e., you know, social workers, you know, agency worker who's coming in to replace his maternity and so on. And this whole business of limited companies that are actually individuals who set themselves up as limited companies and are coming through this thing. So they are the three recommendations I think we as a committee could afford to make. And we could ask Mark to do that piece of work to be objective around whether those IR35 questions have been answered properly. I'll move that yet. Well, that's not absolutely clear what we moved because Jeff, you did say Very helpful. Okay, that we recommend to council and cabinet that any uh, company or individual being employed by the council at uh, 250 pounds a day should be reported to cabinet member for political oversight prior to them being appointed. That uh, independent auditors, uh, Mr. Nibblock and his team, 
review IR35 uh, uh, forms, deciding whether it's in that IR35 or out, those questionnaires that you referenced have been completed uh, to see if they have been filled in honestly and appropriately and as the job has developed. And I think the third one was the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so the third one was the review of um, uh, the review of any of the extensions that have taken place, more than three extensions, that, that those roles should be reviewed, led by HR if necessary, to see if actually this job replaced two. 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 Yeah, yeah, so that's the job. I just wanted to just keep talking about IR35 and we, for people maybe watching this, we're talking about being self employed and working for the council in, in, in layman's terms. Part of being self employed, one of the reasons we've been, uh, this, this is to do with the longevity of the status here, is that you. <coughs> Are able to maybe work for other people if you so wish to, as being self employed. So you can be employed on a self employed basis, work for the council, you can also take on the stuff elsewhere and work outside those hours elsewhere, which we don't seem to do. And, there's, and, and if you can't do that, there's a time scale that states that you stop being classed or deemed as self employed, <coughs> and then become really an employee or a <coughs> employee. So, my, my question really is. To answer Jeff's thing is, why have we not got a statement that put up in the council that says if you're taken on as a consultancy after six months or 12 months, whatever the contract you're taking on for, maybe two year contract, but there has to be a definite end to that contract. It cannot be a rolling contract because we've got situations where people are taken on for a project and on project basis, the project is finished, but then they moved on to another post no, no, we're all supposedly. <laughs> But then their job descriptions change, they may move into a different seat and may do something different, but their role, their contract just rolls and rolls and rolls. It doesn't change, so there must be an, an end to it. That's a limit. That's the truth. Okay, that's, the truth. That, that, that's pretty clear. David. I think a lot of the things I was going to say have actually been covered, but just to go back to basics, what we're trying to avoid is the situation where somebody is employed and because of complacency or because of comfortable reactions to what's going on, this situation is just allowed to continue indefinitely. Now, I don't think it's only political control this wants. It wants departmental control being monitored, possibly by you, Mark, within the individual departments who are taking this action. It shouldn't get to the stage, really, where the political control is necessary, although it's there as an oversight. There should be a mechanism within these departments to make sure this isn't allowed to go on because it's nearly uncomfortable and because people get complacent and somebody says, oh, he's a good guy, I don't think he's any other one. is finished with the contract he's been for in the first place, let's find out something else we can do. Anything going on? I, I can see that happening and I can see it has happened on occasion. But to have a situation, as Kathy has pointed out, where somebody ends up with 400 odd thousand quid over a period of time. Two years, two months, that's still important. Yeah, it's, just, it's just not acceptable. It should have been picked up within the council office of the regime rather than just leaving it for the, for the uh, um, elected members to deal with. Elected members have to oversee it properly. But it should never have got to that stage. And my concern that for whatever reason it has been allowed to get to that stage in a number of instances. That's my concern, Chair. I mean, this is all getting very exciting. I'd like to see how it's going up. But we could be here for another 10, 20 minutes. Can I suggest that we ask Mark to make some comments first?